Welcome to the video audience, wherever it is across the world. Welcome to Belfast tonight. As you can see, as you look around, as you're watching us, God is doing a great thing in this land through his word. And we trust that our blessing will be your blessing tonight. We're studying the life of Moses, and now we're coming to chapter 5 of Exodus. I'm reading in the New King James, which says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron, Exodus 5 and 1, went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with sword. Then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves, and you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not diminish it, for they are idle, therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be led on the men, that they may labor in it. And let them not regard false words. And the taskmasters of the people and their officers went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go get yourselves straw where you find it. Yet none of your work will be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw, and the taskmasters forced them to hurry, saying, Fulfill your work, your daily quota, as when there was straw. Also the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten, and were asked, Why have you not fulfilled your task in making brick, both yesterday and today as before? Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why are you dealing thus with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants that they say to us, Make brick, and indeed your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle, you are idle. Therefore you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Therefore go now and work, for no straw shall be given you, yet you shall deliver the quota of bricks." And the officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble. After it was said, you shall not diminish any bricks from your daily quota. Then as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us abhorrent. Or as some have it, you've made our name to stink in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it that you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abram, to Isaac, to Jacob, as God Almighty. And by my name, Jehovah, I was not known to them. 
I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I'll bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they wouldn't heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go in, speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he may let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, The children of Israel have not heeded me. Brackets, you know, let's be realistic, Lord. How shall I then, Pharaoh, how then shall Pharaoh heed me? If the children of Israel won't heed me, how will he heed me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. Can't speak well. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And then comes this strange passage. W would you like to have a go at reading it in public? All these Hebrew names. I'll, I'll have a try, but it'll be with an Ulster emphasis. These are the heads of their fathers' houses. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, were Hanuk, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the families of Reuben. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Sohar, Shaul, the son of the Canaanite woman. And these are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations. Gershon, uh, Kohath, and uh, Merari. And the years of the life of Levi were 137. The sons of Gershon were Libni and Shimei, according to their families. And the sons of Kohath were Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Aziel. And the years of the life of Kohath were 123. And the sons of Merari were uh, Mahali and Mushi. These are the families of Levi according to their generations. Now Amram took for himself Jochebed, his father's sister, his wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were 137. The sons of Ishar were Korah, Nephag, and Zechari. And the sons of Aziel were Mishael, Elsaphan, and Zithri. Aaron took to himself Elisheba, daughter of Abinadab, the sister of Nashon, his wife, and she bore him Nadab, Ab Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. And the sons of Korah were Aser, Elkanah, and Abasaph. These are the families of the Korahites. Eliezer, Aaron's son, took for himself one of the daughters of Potiel, his wife, and she bore him Phinehas. These are the heads of the fathers of the Levites according to their families. And I'm glad that's over. <laughs> These are the names of Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. These are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are the same Moses and Aaron. And it came to pass on the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh heed me? Now, I wonder, could you give me a wee moment's patience and come over to Genesis 34. This will help us later in the message. Genesis 34. Now, it has to do with the fact that one of Jacob's sons, Dinah, 
has been very badly treated by a man called Shechem. And then Shechem to marry her was asked to be circumcised and they said every male of Shechem had to be circumcised. And then when that happened, Simeon and Levi, sons of Jacob, verse number 25, 34 and 25 of Genesis came to pass on the third day when they were in pain, the two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took a sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. They avenged uh, what had happened to their sister uh, by slaughter. It was a very serious thing to do. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. Now notice what Jacob said in verse 30 because of what these boys of his had done. Verse 30. Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me by making my name stink. That's what it literally means. Among the inhabitants of the land. Among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me and I shall be destroyed. And my household and I. And they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? No, he shouldn't have. But one bad, sinful action didn't mean that they had to murder so many or murder at all in the name of the Lord and the distinctives of the land of Egypt. They did it in the name of religion. Now, you'll see this theme surfacing again in chapter 49 of Exodus, or, or Genesis rather. Genesis 49, and Jacob is dying, and he's summing up things and prophesying. Genesis chapter 49, and he breaks in about verse 5 to talk about these two fellows, heads of the tribes. Verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers, instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. Let not my soul enter their counsel. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man. And in their self-will, they hamstrung or lamed an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So that you will remember then, when we were reading in Exodus 6, and we broke in at verse 14, we heard about the sons of Reuben, didn't we? Exodus 6 and 14. Then we heard about the sons of Simeon. And then we heard about the sons of Levi. And then when we came to the sons of Levi, we stayed with the sons of Levi, right through all the branches of their family, until we came to two Levites, Moses and Aaron, two brothers. And uh, I believe that the passage is more than saying Moses and Aaron were Levites. It's teaching us something deeper, something deeper uh, that has to do with the whole scenario of this story that we're studying. So try and remember that. The concentration in that little genealogy is not on all the tribes of Israel, but it is particularly on the Levites. So then, we're now breaking into the story, chapter 5 and verse 1. It was probably uh, an audience room of some very splendid palace where the lordly Pharaoh received his deputations and embassies. How mixed Moses' feelings must have been as he walked into that beautiful room. 
He must have remembered being brought up there as a child and as a little boy. And his education in that palace and in the whole spectrum of education of the Egyptians. It had been 40 years, which is a long time. I know because I'm over 40. And as he came in, he was a suppliant, of course, of these precincts in the past. And they had played no inconspicuous part in his life. And he in theirs. It is an amazingly powerful statement that comes in the first verse of chapter 5. It's a bit like a thunderclap in the middle of Pharaoh's day and his dynasty's day and the history of the world. Suddenly, these two brothers stand in front of this mighty potentate and say, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And I don't think you would consider me irreverent if I paraphrase Pharaoh's answer as, and who's he? In order to appreciate the seeming audacity of the demand of these two brothers, we must try and remember the power and authority that was claimed by Pharaoh. Every Pharaoh reckoned himself to be a child of the sun. He was depicted as being fondled by the greatest of all the gods and sitting with them in the recesses of their temples receiving worship to him equal to theirs. By the life of Pharaoh was a supreme oath amongst the Egyptians. Without Pharaoh, as far as they were concerned, nobody could lift a foot or lift an arm in all the land of Egypt. For him, Egypt existed. For him, everybody lived and suffered and died. For him, the mighty Nile flowed. For him, the armies of magicians and priests and courtiers worked and ministered. And this Pharaoh had recently had some tremendous victories with his armies. And so it was with utter scorn that he answered the divine demand who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice. I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Pharaoh stands up against Moses. And the emphasis seems to be on the word obey. Who am I? that I should obey his voice. This was not just a request, you know. This was a mandate from one who claimed to have greater authority than he did. Who was this God who dared to issue such a summons? This God of a parcel of slaves. How dare they speak of a paltry deity in his presence? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Ah, it really is the old question, isn't it? Who owns me? From these men to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusing to worship the state government rather going into a fiery furnace than worshipping the state government. Whenever Nebuchadnezzar said the state, which it was him, is God, they said, no, we will not worship the government. And were thrown into a fiery furnace for it. Right up to New Testament days when the Christians refused to say that the emperor was a god or the god. 
up to our day when young people who are Christians refuse to accept the teaching of the New Age movement which says, you are God and I am God and everything is God. It's life's most fundamental question. Who owns me? Or does anybody own me? Is there an ultimate authority? And of course, all that follows with Pharaoh in these stories is God establishing with him the reality, the authenticity, and the authority of himself. He is the Lord God Almighty. Ruth Patterson said a very good thing on UTV last night, which I was deeply moved by. She said, this land is not Ireland, north, south, east, and west, is not divided into Protestant and Catholic, or Unionist or Nationalist, ultimately. It is divided into those who buy to the authority of Jesus Christ and follow him and those who do not. Moses and Aaron met Pharaoh's outburst by softening their tone and pleading that they would be judged by the Lord if he wouldn't let them go. But with even greater anger, Pharaoh responded by insisting on the whole matter as being merely a simple desire to escape from work and a plea for idleness. You're all bone lazy, he is saying, in our language. And the audience ended. The brothers must have come down the corridors to a... Uh, the laughter of the court. What fools those two men were. Did you hear what they said? What a request. And the very same day, says this passage, Pharaoh ordered that the workload of the Hebrews be increased and that they find their own straw and yet produce the same quota of bricks. What fools they looked. Now notice the first cycle of response to God's demand from verse number 1 to verse 9 ended in anguish. And so it may be for you. You stood up for the Lord at college this week, in the university this week, in the hospital this week, on the farm this week, in your family this week, you stood up for the Lord in some issue or other, and the devil himself has stood up against you. Instead of reward and blessing and happiness, you sit in the crescent tonight faced with more trouble than if you'd kept your mouth shut and maybe more trouble than you have ever had before, even in your daily work. You are not the first person who has obeyed God and done God's will in God's way and faced disaster immediately instead of blessing. Notice in cycle two, the taskmasters and four men carried out the new command from verse 10 to verse 14. They announced it to the Hebrew workers who obediently responded and they tried their very best to meet this daily quota, having to go all over the land to get their own straw, but they were unable to fulfill the quota. It was physically impossible under the new conditions that they just couldn't do it. So their taskmasters beat them. 
They beat the foreman of the Hebrews. Then in the third cycle, the Hebrew foreman went to Pharaoh. Notice how humiliating that must have been for Moses and Aaron. They bypassed them, God's spokesman, and they went in themselves and they appealed to him to renege on his decision. But he accused them of being lazy. And then as if it were not bad enough to have Pharaoh stand up against you, the officers of the people of God stood up against Moses and Aaron too. Could there have been more frightening words than verse 21 of chapter 5? Let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made our names stink in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Now, with hindsight, it is very easy for us tonight to see the reason why this was happening. The present suffering that they were going through was as nothing in comparison with the glory that was going to follow, or it was very small in comparison with the glory that was going to follow. You and I would say, well, surely they were being weaned away from trusting in their own power to trusting in the Lord alone. Yes, that's true. But it wasn't so easy to see when your back was opened with a lash and your people were in total despair, millions of them. And believe me, it wasn't any easier for Moses any more than it's easier for you tonight in your circumstances here in Northern Ireland or wherever you are watching who have obeyed the Lord and stood up for him in your day and generation and instead of things getting better in your circumstances, they're getting worse. You say, Derek, I cannot see a way through. Doing God's will in God's way but what a situation. Someone has said, when we see our hopes blasted, our plans miscarry, our efforts do more harm than good, whilst we are being discredited by other people and blamed and pursued with the taunts and the hate of those for whom we were willing to lay down our lives, we may... Preserve an outward calm, but there will be heartbreak underneath. The noblest part in us will wither unless we are able to do something. Is someone sitting here tonight burdened under persecution and pressure and difficulty because of a moral stand that you have made for some principle in the area of sexuality? in the area of business, ethics, in the area of big decision for the future. And if you don't do what Moses did, you will not be able to get relief. What did he do? Well, when everybody stood up against him, he went and stood up before God and poured it all out his complaint. He said two things. In verse 22, he said, Why, Lord? And in chapter 6, and verse number 12, he said, Hi, Lord. Two very simple questions. Why? Why, Lord? And hi, Lord. Why, he says, why is your plan not working out? Why have you brought trouble on this people? And why is it that you sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, after all, Lord, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. And I know you come to this class with many burdens and many difficulties in your heart and life, Christian. And how often have you said, Lord, you promised, but where is the promise? 
Are you asking why? Is there a grieving husband here tonight who has stood by a fresh grave this week wondering how you can go on with your life? Is there watching me now or listening on audio tape a suffering Christian who is strapped to a bed of pain? Is there an orphan who has lost both par parents maybe watching in Romania on this video? Hundreds, thousands of you. And I have gone into an orphanage in Romania and the little ones come and hold on to you and clutch you. A little girl of three followed me everywhere I went and a lady came out with an old broken enamel bowl and she fed 40 of these children sitting on the grass like chickens. Bits of bread. And I was speechless. And the little thing sat on my knee and held on to me. And then when I tried to go, she started to scream. And my other friend, Mr. Lewis, with me, he had a little child with him. And uh, Adrian may be here tonight. He was with us as well that day. He's a Romanian student here at the Belfast Bible College. And he, he brings his bike and he puts it in around the back here every night. Good to have you here in Ulster, brother. And as Adrian showed us around, he'll testify that the little boy on the ground lifted dust up after Tom had tried to get away from the boy to leave the place and threw dust over his head in anger. Orphans forgotten. Why? Somebody here tonight and you're divorced. A soldier watching me about to go into battle. And many a Christian sitting here tonight struggling with a career choice, a direction in life, a purpose in pain, a job security, financial pressures, physical handicaps, relational snags, and dozens of other confusing puzzles not quickly or easily solved. But you have trusted Christ and you've tried to live for the Lord and your circumstances have got no better but worse. When God wants to drill a person and skill a person, when God wants to mold a person to plan the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a person that all the world shall be amazed, watch his methods and watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers them and hurts them and with mighty blows converts them into trial shapes of clay which only God understands while his tortured heart is crying and he's left and he lifts rather beseeching hands. How he bends but never breaks when his good or their good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses them by every act induces them to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. Or in the words of Gordon Wilson, and his daughter Mary used to come to this Bible class killed in the Enniskillen explosion. If there isn't a purpose behind it all, then what would he do but go insane? Why? Why, Lord? If you did God's will and two million people were sent into incredible suffering as a result, would you not question God's will? Like the dear missionary on BCR the other morning from the Acre Gospel Mission, speaking of how he went to South America and his wife died 
when he got off the boat and his first act as a missionary was to bury his wife. Why? And how? How are you going to get me out of this, Lord? Please tell me how you're going to get me out of it. The children of Israel won't heed me. They're not going to. Pharaoh's not going to heed me. And I'm unskilled in speech. He blames his lack of eloquence for his failure to rally the Hebrews. He concluded that if he couldn't persuade his own people to listen, he certainly wouldn't be persuading Pharaoh. He was wallowing in the pit of despair. And the accusation came honing in. You know what you've done, Moses? You have made our name to stink. That's what you've done. So Pharaoh stands up against Moses and the people stand up against Moses and Moses stands up before God. And then, if you like, God stands up before Moses. God's response was to explain to Moses that the purpose of all that was happening and everything that would happen was to bring out a clear declaration of his name. God replies to Moses and he says in verse 2 of chapter 6, he says, now you'll see what I'll do, Moses. I'll bring it about. Why? Because I'm, I'm the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, and they didn't know me by the name that I'm now giving to you. Nobody has ever heard this name, Jehovah, before, but they're about to find out what it's all about. I am God. And when they all stand up against you, Moses, and your faith is at rock bottom, and your faith is blown to bits, and you think that deliverance won't work, and you feel that the doubts and groanings of your life are uh, overwhelming, I am the God who remembers, verse 4, the promise that I made. I made a promise, a covenant, and I'm going to keep it. You will find, Moses, that it is not just theory. Look at verse 7. I will take you as my people, chapter 6 and 7. I'll be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. It won't be a lot of theory in your head. You'll know, because I'm going to prove it to you. You will know. In personal experience, in your circumstances, that I'm not just a book or a list of rules or something that somebody preaches about in a long sermon. You'll know that I am the Lord your God. And if you meet believers who've had their faith ripped apart, particularly in middle life, and they're just about to give up because of the sheer miseries of life, I hope, Christian, that you'll have the ministry that Moses had. I hope you will be able to declare to your generation, to teenagers, to young people, to men and women who are older in the 90s, once again, in a fresh, relevant way, who the Lord really is. To declare the name of God again. A God who keeps his covenant come hell or high weather, who will redeem his people. And this is a very, very powerful thing. Notice in chapter 6, verse 29. I've listed them for you. 6.29, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I'm the Lord, speak to Pharaoh all that I say to you. Chapter 7 and verse number 8. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks, show a miracle, and you shall say, and take your rod and before Pharaoh, and let it become as a servant. The Lord spoke uh, to Pharaoh, or, or, or through the rod. Chapter 10 and verse number 22. You get the same theme coming up again. 
So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. Chapter 9, verse number 14. Uh, 9, 14. I will send my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and on your people that they may know that there is none like me in all the earth. None like me in all the earth. Verse 16, For this purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that 916 my name may be declared in all the earth. Verse number 29 of the same chapter, as soon as I've gone out of this city, I'll spread my hands out to the Lord. The thunder will cease. There'll be no more hail that you may know the earth is the Lord's. Again and again and again, the plagues are going to show you the power of God and who the Lord is. So that you wouldn't be ashamed to go to Queens there next door and stand up in a debating chamber and say, I'd like to show you the Lord's power in the 20th century. Let's study the plagues of Egypt. Would you be prepared to do that or would you get under the seat and say, please, not in that area. They wouldn't believe any of that. That's a lot of mumbo-jumbo to the vast majority of students. They say, no, that's, that's not where to prove God's power. Well, you're going to see it's very relevant as we continue to study. Now notice in chapter 6 and verse number 13, 6 and 13, that Moses is recommissioned to go before Pharaoh. And in verse number 28, you get the same thing. He's recommissioned. Verse 16 and verse 28, he's recommissioned to go again and declare the name of the Lord. But in between, there is this genealogy. What's it all about? And anyway, what is all this business about the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart? We're told right through that these plagues that Pharaoh hardened his heart. But in chapter 9 and verse 12, about halfway through the plagues, it distinctly says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Up until then, he hardened it. Then 9 verse 12, the Lord hardened it. What does that mean? Is God pushing him out or is his hardening his own hardening or is it God's hardening? Well, to put it very simply, God was about to use Pharaoh as a vessel of wrath. Sometimes God falls in judgment on a certain situation. Why? So that others might be saved. We read that when the children of Israel eventually got out of Egypt and they got to the city of Jericho, there was a prostitute in Jericho, and she said, hey, she said, I want to join you. I've heard about you people, what the Lord did to Pharaoh, and I want to become one of the believers. See? And she hung a scarlet line out the window and her whole family were saved. God made his wrath and judgment lead to the salvation of other people. That's what he does constantly. And of course, when God said that he would harden Pharaoh's heart, he knew what Pharaoh was going to do, that he was going to uh, constantly harden his heart. And then God eventually stepped in and fixed him in the stance that he had already decided to take. You watch it. God doesn't do that to you. He got every opportunity, but he crossed over the line, and God fixed him in what he decided, and let him have his choice. And anyway, what was God doing in sending plagues to Egypt? Was he hardening Pharaoh and Pharaoh refusing to obey, and then God was going to destroy him? Well, if God was going to destroy him, why did he take so long to destroy him? 
All these nine plagues didn't persuade Pharaoh to let the people go. It was the tenth one that persuaded him. Well, then why did he bother with all the other nine? What were they about? If he simply meant to destroy them, why didn't he do that? With the Passover and the angel of death coming over. Why didn't he do that right away? Why all these plagues? Well, the answer is giving in this genealogy. Simeon, Reuben, and then Levi. And then detail on Levi. And what was wrong with Levi? Well, Levi, from whom Moses and Aaron came, as I've told you, was a very cruel, cruel man. You go back into Genesis 34 and read it at your leisure what he did when you have time. But the simple answer is that they were cruel and they did it in the name of God and wrecked vengeance in God's name. And Jacob said, you've made my name to stink. Well, isn't that what the children of Israel had just said to Moses? You made our name to stink in the sight of these Egyptians. What was Jacob saying whenever he was dying? He says, don't enter into the counsel of those fellows of mine, Levi particularly, and Simeon, because the wrath of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. Now we're about to study Moses and Aaron taking the rod of God and smiting the land of Egypt. And God is saying, don't you dare accuse Moses and Aaron of wrecking vengeance upon the land just to get revenge in the name of religion, rationalizing their own wrath to get revenge. That's not what they're going to do. They are not like that former Levi. Plagues anyway were not the execution of God's wrath in the full and final sense. These plagues we're going to see weren't the execution of God's wrath. Ultimately, the Passover plague or past death at the Passover of the firstborn in Egypt certainly was God's judgment. These plagues that we're going to study serve a very different purpose and function. And Moses, in verse 28 of chapter 6, is obsessed with his inability to speak. For the third time, the man is obsessed with it. I can't speak, Lord. I cannot speak properly. And the more I study this, I'm coming to think that he was so long away from Egypt. It wasn't a stammer as some people think he had, but he had forgotten how to speak Egyptian. Because Stephen in Acts 7, summing him up, said before, long before he left Egypt, he was mighty in word and deed. And he couldn't understand Egyptian and he was stumbling and stammering with it and he's obsessed with it. And God says, Moses, Moses, your speaking won't bring the people out. I will. Verse 4 of chapter 7, Pharaoh won't heed you so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. I'm going to do it, not you. And you're speaking. So what are the plagues going to teach us? They're going to teach us the name of God in a way that the world has never seen before. They're going to show God's uniqueness, his characteristics, his attributes, and Pharaoh wanted to know who the Lord was. Maybe just like you. And he was about to find out. 
So don't retreat from doing God's will. Stand fast on God's nature and promises. Remember that your circumstances are forcing you to depend on God and that'll take patience and patience will make you wise. You have all that you need, Christian, in Christ. As Vance Havner said, Christ is all we have, he's all we need, he's all we want. We are shipwrecked on God and stranded on omnipotence. So when they all stand up against you, go to talk to the Lord about it. He'll listen to you. And then he'll send you out to tell the people once again who he really is.